to be there. Hi. Good morning or good evening where you're at. And today we have Waya Arauz. Wichanko? How do you say it? Wichanko. I always say Waya Arauz. <laughs> she's the chef behind Gourmet Gypsy. And she's, uh, in my mind, she's a hero for this year. Actually, when I was thinking about um, who I wanted to, to talk to before the year ended, Waya was the first one who came to my mind because she has been present nonstop throughout the pandemic. Like her work, her, I don't know where she gets that spirit, but it's been tirelessly like she taking care of the, the food for the healthcare professionals, for the frontliners nonstop throughout the pandemic. I don't know. We'll find out how many days she was doing it. But on top of that, she has also like helped out with um, the last typhoon in the Philippines. And we do have a lot of calamities in the Philippines and why has just been there. That's just her nature. So, um, and I was thinking it is Christmas, but I, th I think the most important message during this season and probably the whole message throughout this year, the strongest one that stands out is giving. And I couldn't think of a better person to talk to today than Waya. So good morning, Waya. Good morning. Thank you. You're going to make me cry start pala. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was like, oh, is she going to start to cry? But I, I had no doubt in my mind that um, you, were the, you were the perfect person to talk to. Um, from a distance, I was watching you through Facebook. And every single day, when I was struggling just alone in my own lockdown, just struggling day by day, there you are. <laughs> figuring out what to do with like, I don't know how many kilos of carrots or I don't know how many kilos of potatoes. <laughs> Two in the morning when I'm about to sleep or whatever, there you are still like talking to Gang Badoy, figuring mm -hmm. out what's going to happen, tr troubleshooting for the next day. And I couldn't, you know, like, I'm just in awe of what that is. Um, for For this is not a proper introduction to what no, Wyatt <laughs> what Wyatt does, but I I my only compass with the people I talk to or the people I interview or the people who spark so much light from within and, and you had been a bright star for for us this year. Um amidst the darkness. I don't know. <laughs> I rarely meet people who have just been that. And after months and months and months of the pandemic, the Philippines hits a typhoon and there you are. <laughs> Off she goes to a province against what? Eight hours away from Manila? Well, 16 hours. <laughs> 16 hours. And there she is with her pots and pans and a big smile. And she's like, okay, ready to cook. When, when Marikina uh, City in Manila was submerged in the floods, it was in a few hours why I was like, okay, who can cook rice? <laughs> she, was, she was shouting out, okay, who can cook rice? We'll take care of everything and, you know, cook rice in your rice cookers and we'll get that. I don't know what that is, but I think that, that's, that's like, that's pure kindness. But um, for, I know I'm gushing, but um, it just comes from a place of pure, pure appreciation and pure awe. But can you tell us a little bit I, more about, I guess, for, for the people listening, what, who Waya is? She's, a, she's the owner of Gourmet Gypsy. If you go to this restaurant, it's quirky, it's warm, it's cozy. Um, and there's just so much art. Um, and you had two restaurants, but now you have one. But yeah. what, how would you describe your, your cuisine? After well, I try, I'm like, okay. <laughs> I know. <laughs> let's let's get the tears out of the way first. Actually, um, Gourmet Gypsy is like a restaurant of memories to me. So it's like bringing home travel memories, um, memories from my childhood, from growing up, and putting it on a plate. So that's you know that's why the menu is very eclectic. It's we call it global cuisine, but it's actually a cuisine of you know. Of of where I've been in my life, 
both in the Philippines and abroad and memories from growing up and you know people I've met and putting it on a plate so that's that's why you know gourmet gypsy have always wanted to be cozy I wanted it to be relaxed because that's that's how that's how I envision myself to be so that's that's the story of gourmet gypsy and there was just so much art that the sculpt the tables were yeah because were, my dad was a sculptor your right? dad's not just a sculptor he's a crazy <laughs> wacky person he's an yeah. activist so, he's yeah. landscape mm -hmm. architect he's yeah he's all around creative guy but it shows as you are too for mm -hmm. And that's what the food in Gourmet Gypsy is. I don't think you can put it in a box. It's not, necess it's not necessarily Filipino food. It's, no. it's different. Um, I don't even, I hardly do Filipino food in the restaurant actually. Because I mm -hmm. think that the best Filipino food to Filipinos is your food at home. So uh -huh. like there's no competing with your mother sinigang, your lola's kare kare. Because there's nostalgia connected to it. Uh -huh. So, I give you my own nostalgia of my own traveling and my own stuff so that, you know, it's different. It's my story on your plate, not yours. <laughs> I'm not trying to get yours. So, um, and that's the thing with Filipino food. Everyone thinks that their version of their adobo, adobo is the Filipino food, the national dish of the Philippines, which is... Um, chicken or pork cooked in vinegar and soy sauce. Um, but everyone thinks their own version of adobo is much better than someone else. And usually, as, as Wayo was saying, you have the best adobo in your home, not in restaurants. Um, so have you always wanted to become a chef? No. Um, it was actually a... A, a second career. I worked in development work for a long time after college. So I was doing a lot of um, work uh, in the Philippines and in the re region doing community-based tourism development as doing environmental conservation work and um, enterprise development in local communities uh, in the Philippines and in the Indo-Pacific region. So that's why I did so much traveling around the region for the first 12 years of my career. And then um, I quit in 2000. Uh, my mom got sick and I wanted to take care of her. And then uh, somebody asked me to cook. A friend of my dad called me and said, can you cook? Fabada, it's my 60th birthday. And uh, I really want your dad's Fabada. I'm like, unemployed, let's go. <laughs> and then he calls me like after five minutes, oh, and that salad that goes so well with it. Okay. And then his wife calls me after 15 minutes. She said, Waya, can you please cater Charlie's birthday? Because he's driving me crazy calling different suppliers. I'm like, I'm not a caterer. <laughs> No, but you do your dad's parties all the time. You can do this. It's only 60 people. Only 60 people. For your first <laughs> catering job for 60 people. <laughs> so I said, okay. It's so funny because like the waiter came up to me. Mom, where can I find the skirt? I'm like, what's skirting? <laughs> what's that? What is a skirting? Yeah. <laughs> so anyway, I got through that. And from that party, I got three bookings. Wow. But your first so, party is for 60 people. Where do you even? <laughs> so I got three bookings. So I did three parties. By the time I got to my 10th, I'm like, huh, there's a career in here. So I actually went to school and studied just to, you know, revalidate and get myself professionalized for it. And that's how my culinary career started. But I've been cooking since I was a kid. We're a cooking family. So. Uh -huh. You know, so it was a natural progression. So when did you start? What year was that? 2000? 2000, yeah. 2000, wow. But it's evolved also. Like yes, it's evolved a lot. Like, um, you know, it was, uh, you know, it was also a journey of finding who I am as a cook, as a chef. You know, I never used to call myself chef. As, you know, I just didn't feel like uh, it was uh, 
I deserved it <laughs> or something. But now, I, you know, when I, I, I actually already teach in, you know, I do a lot of talks with um, chefs in training in culinary schools and I always tell them, you know, you can call yourself a chef when you can tell your story through food and you can put it on a plate. Which is exactly what you, yeah. you do or you, you're doing with Gourmet Gypsy, not just taking them with the food, but you're, they're actually traveling with, with you through your different plates and I guess like different parts of your life with each dish. Is there one dish that stands out that has become like a signature Gourmet Gypsy dish? But I can't put one dish. People it's, like different things, right? Yeah, people put different things. I think it's more of the the wholeness of the of the story and the concept. You know how how gourmet gypsy has evolved as not just as a restaurant, but also as a as a social story. Like how we support farmers, how we incorporated uh, inclusion in our. Uh, program, you know, with the school we're training young adults with special needs, how to get to work. So Gourmet Gypsy is actually a laboratory for inclusive employment. And then we've also branched out to, you know, being an enterprise incubator for products that our students make and their families make. So like when we did the grocery this year, we wanted to feature products of women and people with disabilities and, and showcase them in the grocery. So can you tell me, like, how, I, I read about it, like, how did Open Hand come about? Like, you were, you were doing cooking I just classes. The, I, I have cooking classes in the summer, and then one mother came up to me and said, my son has autism, but he really likes to cook. Um, is it okay if he joins your classes? So I said, yeah, let's try. Let's see how that works out. And so um, he really liked it, and then other kids with uh, autism and ADHD started to join. It started to spread in the SPED community that there's a chef who would teach uh, special needs uh, students cooking. So I ended up with so many students. I'm like, what am I going to do with you guys? <laughs> um, if I just teach them cooking, it's not enough to get them somewhere, you know, to get them a job, to get them independent. So I decided, okay, um, we need to make this like a holistic program. So I got together with some SPED teachers, we had consultants who helped me put together the program of Open Hand to make it, to make it like a holistic vocational program for young adults with special needs to get to work. Because like, no, that segment it's not really catered for like these are yeah. teens and yeah. adults because like, yes. kids yeah you can find special needs yeah, kids there's all sorts of schools for kids and then you know uh like especially here in the philippines you know how parents put a premium on a college education so there's a lot of uh young adults with special needs who are forced through college just so they can say oh at least i can say that my uh child has graduated, even high school or college. Mm -hmm. But then, you know, like I get students who have graduated from college but can't work because they don't have the basic skills needed to help them survive, uh, you know, a traditional work environment. And one thing I love about um, how you incorporate them into your restaurant and to other restaurants as well. Yeah. Um, What's the Italian restaurant near? Cucina di Francesco. Yeah. yeah, the thing with you don't advertise yourself as a restaurant with special needs servers because oh, for no. you, that's not that, that's not that, it's not it's a market not. it's not a marketing thing. It's actually no, no, no. Uh -oh. if people if people don't notice that they're special needs, it's a, even a bigger success, right? For that yeah. who had served them, yeah. and there was just so much pride. I remember, yeah, the one next to Padre Pio, the, the kid was just. The, the, he was just like so happy to to tell me about what he was going to serve, and then he, so there's just so much, and you can feel that as as a as a customer, you can feel mm -hmm. their pride in what they're doing. Yeah, and we make sure that they get paid, mm -hmm. you know, and that they get uh, and that they actually work because that's the one thing that we don't like is, you know, in Filipino we call it saling pusa. 
you know, they're like token employees just so you can show people that you're doing it. And it's, uh, you know, it's a charitable thing. Like our students, we make them, you know, we always remind them, you have to do quality work. You have to, you have, you actually have to prove yourself and you have to show that you can do as hard and as, uh, as good a job as the others and earn your place. It's real empowerment. It's yeah. a real job. So, you know, they're really proud of what they do and um, they love it that they earn money and, you know, that they're able to um, have friendships with the people they work with. You know, when they get their pay, they're like, oh, what are we going to do? Are we going to watch a movie? Or, you know, we teach them how to save. You know, it's the best way to teach financial management also to people with special needs is to have their own money. And that's real empowerment. It's not yeah. no longer being... Um, reliant on their parents and at the same time I think that was the, how it began that the parent was yeah. what would happen to them if they if yes. they pass away or if they grow old and they can't take care of their kids anymore so mm-hmm. what you're what you're giving it's it's like you're teaching them how to fish it's 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 no longer it, it's not a dole out at all it's really yeah. and I like how seamlessly it goes with the with mm-hmm. with the restaurant so it's it's mm-hmm. there and all of that so so the pandemic happened. You th- tell tell me how you got involved with um, what do you call the group that started? Um, uh, frontline feeders. Frontline feeders. Yes, that's the group with gang and yes. um, Andy. I was actually with two groups. With um, I was with Salamat PH Healthcare Heroes and Frontline Feeders PH. So I've always been involved in relief efforts. So even way before Yolanda, every time there's a pandemic, eh, no, not, not a pandemic, Calamity. but there's a calamity <laughs> in the Philippines. Um, I've always gone out of the way to uh, help with relief work. And I've always been with the food part because that's my, that's my thing. It's so, your jam. <laughs> yes, yeah, my jam. So, um... When the pandemic, before, before the pandemic hit, uh, before the lockdown happened, actually. So I was talking with uh, Gang and other people, and they were saying, you know, the problem with the lockdown is all the food sources of the hospitals are going to dry up. The frontliners won't have anywhere to buy food. That's why we needed to supply food to the hospitals. So, because all the restaurants would be closed, or, you know, it's a practical thing because yeah and there was no transport yeah there was no transport and um they were going to be locked down in the hospitals as well so So, this started in march it started in march so we actually started uh supplying food to frontliners on the second day of the lockdown so I spoke to my staff uh, maybe two days before the lockdown. I I told them, okay, this is what we're going to happen. This is a totally different uh, crisis we're dealing with. It's not a storm. It's not an earthquake. It's a pandemic. So we need to be locked down ourselves. If we want to do this and do this safely. Uh, So all of my staff were quarantined in their facility. I stayed there for four straight months, no going home. So I told months. my staff, if I'm going to ask you to do something hard, I'm going to do it with you. <laughs> so you were feeding people for four, so four, three, 120 days? Am I right? Yes. And you were feeding, there was a number. I don't know how many you were feeding. We did for over 50,000 meals. Actually, the f- first 50,000 we did in 50 days. And then we we kept going after that. <laughs> for around 120 days. So amidst all of this, mm-hmm. while we didn't know what was going on and we couldn't figure out and everyone was just freaking out and afraid, what kept you going? Like, Well, because I was also freaking out and afraid. <laughs> and this was, uh, I mean, you know, people kept saying, what? We are so, I'm like, God, there's freaking out and afraid the whole time. And um, I guess it was ano, it was an escape for me too. You know, you know, if after I had this session with Gang, and you know, we had this debriefing after, and we we're all crying. And like we escaped actually, 
you know, from the freaking out and afraid, just the being busy all day coordinating and cooking thousands of meals actually saved us from it being... You, it kept you sane. Uh, it kept us sane for a while. And then I had this major dip maybe day, day 150 <laughs> of the... I was like, shit, what am I going to do now? You know, I mean, I'm no longer doing frontline feeding. I've, you know, transitioned the restaurant to a grocery. But, but you know, it's we just couldn't see the end. We still don't see the end of this we, time. We don't know. And then to add to that, like, there, yeah, there are other things that are happening as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, you know, and then... Uh, the, it's still a huge problem in the Philippines because the government is unbelievable. <laughs> you know, like, you think it can't get any worse, and it does every damn day. So, you know, it actually, it, it's just, we just keep trying to keep things moving, which is why we keep doing whatever we can. So we don't fall into the pit of hopelessness and despair because... It's so easy to slip into that here. So while you were helping, you, it actually helped you as well. Yeah, yeah. That's really, that's really actually for me, that's actually what saved me this year. Wow. And that's something to, to think about. I guess people tend to, to think about, worry about giving that, you know, they always say you can't give from an empty cup, right? Yeah. But, but that's then, also what fills up your cup. Except, and the, the, the other thing, the, the counter um, thought for, for me is you also have to strengthen your giving muscle. Because yeah. when I think about it, I don't think you, mm -hmm. you became this person who, <laughs> well, apparently you like being thrown to the deep end because you were able to cook for 60, 60 people on your first catering job. But I don't think you would have been able to cook for 120 days straight serving other people if you haven't been doing, you know, yeah. been giving and giving. And it wasn't just, um, just to, to be clear, it just wasn't the, the frontliners and the healthcare workers that you were helping. There were, you mentioned there were also like construction workers, um, yeah, barangays that barangays because well. um yeah um we were receiving a lot of donations and not all of the donations we receive are you know usable for frontline feeding because there were you know we had um so like for example we'll get like a meat donation that's odd parts meat is very loosely defined you know <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> this thing. And it's just difficult because, you know, like the frontliner meals, we have to be packaged. It has to be individually packaged and everything. So if it's, if we're doing a thousand meals a day and it's, um, it's odd bits and pieces of uh, meat, it's hard to use. Yeah. So what we do, we send those things to the barangay community kitchens because they know better how to deal with it because they'll just put it in a pot, make it into soup or whatever. So that's how we, we decided, you know, just so we can use everything. And then we'd get donations of tons of vegetables. Mm -hmm. Shell Foundation would buy veg because we had a real difficulty trying to get ingredients in because the transport across the across the barricades was very difficult <laughs> so if you needed something that would come from outside of Metro Manila uh, it had to go through so many permits and stuff so it, it became you know the big players like Shell Foundation for example would be able to go through the barricades so they buy from farmers in Rizal, in Benguet, in uh, Nueva Vizcaya and Nueva Ecija and bring it to Manila and donate it to the feeding efforts. So my location, which was, uh, you know, I had a, I have a big location in Quezon City, became a hub for donations. So we'd receive like 15 tons of vegetables from Shell Foundation and then I'd call all, all of the other kitchens or doing relief work and I'll tell them, okay, the vegetables are here, you can come and 
get it from me. get it from us so you know so that's my alternate career is I can be a dispatcher <laughs> other struggle every I day you moving it. because it's vegetable so it can you know it'll spoil quickly yeah you have to keep moving so every day yeah. every day it's every a day. challenge and you have to figure yeah. out what's going on yeah. and so I, learned, you know, I learned how to make kimchi and pickles and all of all sorts of things really, really quickly so that, you know, we can preserve all these vegetables. Because I always say, you know, we have to own, honor the donor's intention. They gave it so that it will go somewhere. So we have to make sure that it doesn't go to waste. So we were, you know, very conscious about getting it out as quickly as possible, getting to people who need it, and also preserving whatever we can. So, you know, it's... We were pickling every day, making kimchi, making all sorts of things to make sure that the jams and chutneys, to make sure that nothing goes to waste. So, all those, uh, and then after that, you closed your restaurant in April. Gourmet yeah, I did. Well, yeah, you, I did. You have two restaurants, so one had to close. You you made a decision that to close one of the restaurants in. Yes, it was actually one of the first, or maybe even the first, to declare a restaurant closure in Metro Manila, to openly declare. And, um, you know, I made the decision because, you know, I saw that, you know, this pandemic is not going to end soon. Quickly, yeah. And um, even if we reopen, and if we, re we reopen for takeout, there's no there's no point in having two outlets and two overheads and you know so I said okay we need to shut one down and the logical choice was to shut down the Roses location because it was a standalone restaurant and the other one is much bigger and the school is also there so it saves the two uh, businesses or at least it saves the location for open hand for when it's ready to open again yeah. Oh, yeah so that's why we closed it and then you started introducing a grocery like a mini grocery into a the mini grocery, yes. operation because, so. you know we had to figure out like how are we gonna um because i was you know we were in lockdown since the beginning all my staff were quarantined so i wanted an operation that was also safe for us mm -hmm not just for the customers, to make the, you know, the sacrifice of our quarantine worthy. So we did the grocery by appointment. So when you come in, we only let in two people at a time, two customers at a time, so that, you know, you can also shop in peace and confidence that you're not, uh, you're well, well distanced with the other shopper. And then, you know, you, you have the whole hour to yourself just shopping. So it also brings back, like, you know, grocery shopping is such a, it's such a relaxing, therapeutic thing for me. And that's something we we missed altogether uh -huh. in this pandemic. Because, so, you know, you go to the grocery, you have your shield, your mask, and you're like, you're like that. You're like, nobody stick to me. <laughs> if anyone, <laughs> nobody should go near me. And you're like super, super paranoid. So we wanted a relaxed environment to, you know, at least relax your brain, shop for your food, you know, in a nice location and breathe a little. <laughs> through and the you also chose, like, you're also helping some small businesses with, with yes. the, the, I guess, like the produce. And, yes. and then you started introducing um, ready-to-cook meals as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we converted our menu to ready-to-cook, ready-to-heat ready to eat so also because people were also learning how to cook as saying you know our customers are now our competition because they finally learned how to cook i know so so we like did our menu in different levels of cooking ability so if you like have zero cooking ability we have stuff that you can just stick in the microwave or just put the stove to heat and it's ready and then there's also, you know, ready to cook things like sausages, you know, a little bit more cooking ability. Uh, we have like chicken cut ups and salmon fillets and, you know, things that, you know, easier to cook than just getting stuff from the grocery and putting it together. So we have like sauces, like we, we bottle their Indian butter sauce so that you can just 
grill your chicken tikka and then you stop it with Indian butter sauce and you already have our Indian butter chicken. So, you know, we, we, and then we also have like the more complicated stuff so that if you, uh, if you're an advanced cook, we have some, some esoteric hard to find ingredients that we offered on sale so that, you know, you can, you can also flex your creative muscles with cooking. So we have stuff for that. Hmm. So it's it's really you mastered the pivot. You, you I guess the the whole one hundred twenty days of cooking for the frontliners and for healthcare workers. You mastered how to pivot in the pandemic because I think that's the only way you can survive during any any uh, business can survive. I don't think I would call myself a master. I mean, you know, it's not like we we made money in spades. So it was uh, it was a way for us to you know just keep going. I keep telling my staff, you know, we really have to refocus our targets. We can't uh, we can't expect to make money. I was just saying, you know, our goal is just, you know, to be able to uh, get us through the end where we're all healthy, we'll all survive and we have something to start on eventually. Which is why we decided to close up the restaurant early. Because my accountant was saying, every day that you're not deciding, you're losing money. And if you hit you know, uh, if you lose everything, then you can, there's no way you can come back again. Yeah. So you know, cut down early so that you can you can come back. So let's shift a little bit into um, Filipino Christmas. I guess I guess it's something that's hard to talk about this year, but I guess just to give a flavor of what, what is, just to give our listeners a concept of like, what is Filipino, what is Christmas for you? What, cause for me, oh my gosh, Filipino, for me, my concept of Christmas, just to give our listeners uh, an idea. It's the smell of bibingka. It's, it's, it's the rice cakes at five in the morning. We have nine days before Christmas. So we have masses at dawn. So usually it's like four. Don't have nine days before Christmas. It starts in September. Yeah, but but, <laughs> but, but the the the, the yeah. masses would be at four thirty in the morning, and they have the bibingka, which are the rice yeah. cakes mm-hmm. cooked in coals, and then um put the bong which is the purple. Yeah. Purple. What do you call those? Purple tubes of rice <laughs> yeah. with coconut. So for me, that's. That the smell of the bibing of the charcoal of that cooking on charcoal smells like okay Christmas is coming and then the Philippines is hot so that's the only time we can actually wear our sweaters when it's when it's like what a few degrees cooler but that's our that's our concept of like things getting colder but food wise what is Christmas what is Filipino Christmas food for you like what when you think of um, your Christmas meals, what comes to your mind? Well, my mom always makes molo for Christmas. Oh. So since we were kids, once December hits, she would, you know, buy all her ingredients, do her dumplings. So like in the evenings after dinner, we would all be around the table wrapping dumplings and she would be packing them and freezing them. So that throughout the Christmas holidays, we would always have a pot of molo on the stove so that's like a big crisp and then my dad would make fabada so huge huge batch of fabada and then he'd pack it and also give it away to his friends with um frozen with kamuning pandesal wait just um, to give just to give our our listeners an idea of what um pancit mola is pancit mola are dumplings they're just filipino yeah. dumplings yeah. you make it with chicken and pork yeah, she makes it with pork and shrimp. And shrimp. And then, yeah. And then it's cooked in a broth. In a chicken broth? Well, she does the uh, mixed broth. So chicken and pork. And then broth. we top it with like toasted garlic and, toasted garlic and, and um, onions. green onions. Yeah. So that's like uh, a warm. But why pancit molo? It, it, that's, I don't know. It's, some, it's just something, you know, that became a... It's a family favorite, so I think it started when we were like, we're not even Ilongo. 
<laughs> we got it actually from one of our house help who was Ilongo who taught my mom and then and then she made it her own so now it's like a science she has the ratios she knows exactly how many dumplings she'll get from that ratio and it's a science to her already <laughs> And I've actually featured her molo balls in my grocery. Because she said I'm retiring when the pandemic hit. My mom decided she wouldn't practice anymore. She's a physician. Uh So she said, you know, at my age, and I don't think I can ever go back to private practice, she said. So I I have to figure out something to do. She said, why don't you make your molo and sell it? So she made her molo in her Lumpiang Shanghai. And I sell it in the grocery. So that's her new career. So people can actually now experience your mom's molo in their own homes. Yeah, and it's called Inay Molo in my restaurant. Oh, there you go. <laughs> but what about your dad's fabada? Is that his, that's his classic thing? That's, that's something he's always... Yeah, had. it's also something that he's, I know, he's developed on his own. So, you know, it's so far removed from traditional fabada. He also has his mechado. It's also far removed from his, from mechado as we know. I've always had this discussion with him, like, he cooks this mechado, and he said, it's not mechado, it's caldereta, because it has liver. Mm-hmm. He said, no, it's mechado, because mechado means there's a mecha of, of fat. Oh. And yeah, but I use this part of the beef called bato, which is marbled with fat. So it's naturally mechado. So this is a mechado. So after he died, on the first anniversary of his death, I put the mechado on the menu of gourmet gypsy and called it a mas mechado. But it's a caldereta. <laughs> but because he's dead, I can't you argue anymore. Argue with him. I have to call it mechado. <laughs> Argument is done. <laughs> just to give the listeners some idea of a bad, that it's actually something we got from, the spa- from our Spanish past. So it's the beans cooked in oh, with uh, pork, yeah. Yeah, pork and sausages. Pork and sausages, which is very rich and hearty. Um, well, I guess it's also ideal for December weather because it's our coldest season, if you can call it that. But yeah, but it's it, it it's a party. It's a celebration food. Um, so this year, I guess it's a very different Christmas for most people, for everyone, not just the Philippines, but the whole world. And um. One of the, the things, one of the challenges for for many people is even just to to have a meal this Christmas. And that's one of the things that you're doing as well is to to feed um, families who, who've lost yeah. their homes. Yes. And because of the last typhoon, yeah. Ulysses. So um so what you're doing is you're creating a, a Christmas meal for them. And people are welcome to help out and, and to donate this. And then they don't even have to cook. Why is going to take care of cooking it? So it's, it's just, but these are families in which In Marikina part? in Rizal. So Marikina, um, actually the families that we're going to give the meals to are the ones, these are the volunteers of Bayanihang Marikina, Marikenya and Marikenyo. So despite the fact that their houses got flooded in too, they were the ones who put up community kitchens and cook for their neighbors. Mm-hmm. So we wanted to, you know, tell them that, okay, this Christmas, you took care of the others, we'll take care of you mm-hmm. this Christmas. So we've listed, for Marikina, we're giving 200 families Noche Buena Packs. And then for Rizal, we're giving, right now we have 100. We've committed for 100. For Dumagat families in Rodriguez and Wawa Risa. So these people have almost completely lost their homes. So how many families are we talking about altogether? Right now, we're committed to 300. Wow. Okay. So we're trying to get it uh, a little bit higher. <laughs> yeah. 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 And, and I think for a lot of people now, just the fact that you're okay and you're healthy and you're alive yeah. is, is reason. I mean, uh, <laughs> It, it makes you feel like you want to, to give and, and to do that. Okay, so I'm going to go full circle now. We, we touched on this a little bit. And um, one thing I'm passionate about this year, well, it has been evolving the past few years, was, was um, 
finding yourself and finding your spark and, and self-care. And, and this is, um, I'm in awe of people like you who have so much life, who bring so much life into what they do. And I guess what I'm trying to find out is like, what feeds your spirit? Because it takes a lot to wake up every day and be like, okay, I'm cooking 2000 meals today. You know, I mean, it's, it, you're giving up, you're, you're giving your, what you're sharing is not just your time and your finances and your resources, but like the physical. So, so how, I, I guess for other people who are listening or other people like me, where do you draw that strength and where does that come from? Well, I guess it comes from, duty or oblique. It's, it's, you know, we've always been told when you can, you must. Mm-hmm. You know, um, when this is, you know, what, what are the things that I have uh, at my disposal? I have a huge kitchen. I have staff. I have the skills. You know, when we were um, planning for the Marikina feeding, Ulysses, I was in Antipolo taking care of my mom and the storm was like raging around us and I was texting with people, okay, this is going to be super bad. Uh, I think we need to set up something for Marikina because we're already receiving the news that, you know, Marikina was already underwater. So even before the wind subsided and the floodwaters receded, we already had a plan in place. People already started... uh, pooling donations so that by the morning of the flood, we had our first meals out. And I was actually really pissed because why are we ahead of the government? (laughs) Why are we so good at this already that, you know, we can pull something together that quickly? It's because we have so much practice. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know, it's taken us years of practice that we've gotten this to uh, to a, down to a science. Like, you know, um, like gang is on my speed dial. <laughs> Every time something happens, like, oh gang, what are we going to do now? Um, how are we going to get food? Whose truck are we going to use? You know, like when we did the Cagayan Relief Caravan, that was a 10-hour planning. And we were able to get like 25 tons of relief goods in three trucks and the whole kitchen. In 10 hours. In 10 hours. You know? And then we we left like 24 hours later. And these are tireless women. Gang is another woman. Most of them. <laughs> yeah. and, and they're men too. But gang, gang is, a, gang is, a, is a, a, another tireless woman who just works nonstop behind the scenes, just getting all these things together, connecting people, finding the nature. Um, you know, it's, that's why now we're talking, you know, we have to, uh, we have, to, we, we can't be the government. <laughs> we have to, we have to be able to, you know, demand these things and make sure that people get it. It's, it's just, you know, it, we were just not raised to, you know, stand idly by. There's just no way I can, I can, you know, stay in my house and be comfortable and know that there are people suffering around. But what do you do in terms of like self-care for yourself? What does that look like? Of course, mm-hmm. like as you said, at, the, at a certain time during the pandemic, you're just like, ah, you know, you're just... Uh, you know, well, I took a deep dive into K-drama. <laughs> So Korean drama is is yeah. is um at the end of the day is that something you would watch to like yeah. calm you yeah. down just download my brain and you know and spending time with the family fixing the house you know I was away from my house for four months as in quarantine so when I got back home so fixing my uh fix you know putting things in order purging my closets and stuff like that so that was part of you know what I did and like I take a I didn't have a day off for maybe five months straight straight so after after that I actually took a dip Uh, I had a very low point and you know shut down for maybe 10 days 
just to, to, to replenish. Yeah, replenish and reset my brain. And then I guess what what I wanted to ask, because obviously what you're doing is for the but for you to to share with other people listening, how can they how what what little act can they do to help other people? Of course, not everyone can be like you who could yeah. cook or whatever, but since you have been in, at the heart of, of helping people feed the healthcare workers and the frontliners, what, what is something they can do during this holiday season? Like maybe like something small that they can do or how can community, because your, your other gift is gathering communities together. That's something you're good at. That's the other thing, you know, I've learned through the years is if you tell people exactly what to do, you know, a lot of people want to help. They just don't know how. So, you know, the in, in fact, it's something I learned too, is how to get other people to help. When we were doing the Marikina feeding, um, we were always stuck with the rice. It's, it's, it's really hard work to cook that much rice. We're trying to do 2,500 meals a day and then pack it uh, for distribution. So... I decided that, okay, we're going to let others help us. We're going to make a call for people to cook rice in their homes, let them wrap it individually, and then bring it to us, and we have a time cut. So I posted and had a nervous breakdown. <laughs> like, oh my God, what if it doesn't come? <laughs> what if they don't cook? What if they ignore me? When are we going to decide that we need to cook the rice ourselves? <laughs> But, you know, it was a lesson in faith and it arrived, you know, every day. We asked for 2,500 uh, servings of rice. Every day we got over 4,000. Every day. And it was, you know, like, there was one, the first day, someone knocked on our gate and gave me three cups of rice. I cried. I'm like, oh, I heard, and, you know, we we're going to have to, to pack it for you. And I'm like, oh my God. <laughs> Three cups of rice. It's just like um, a moment, <laughs> a complicated moment. <laughs> so um, it's really, you know, there's just so many ways to help. Like for at the time when we were feeding frontliners, a friend of mine was growing herbs. And she's like, can I harvest my herbs and bring it to you and can you use it? And, you know, and then she did it every day. I had a friend who bakes. So I told her, you know what? I have so much baking supplies because the restaurant is closed. Can it just send you the flour and everything uh, so that you can just keep baking? So she kept baking brownies and banana bread and all sorts of things. And she delivered it and I put it in the meals for the frontliners. So, you know, there's so many ways you can help. In like every Christmas, my dad used to feed street kids. And uh, there's one time he had a party for street kids in our garden and gave them apples. Mm. And the kids didn't eat it. They didn't eat it. They didn't eat it. They were just hanging onto their apples. And my dad just like, why aren't you eating your apples? They said, because if we go home and we tell our friends that we had a whole apple to ourselves, they're not going to believe it. So we want to be able to show it. So my dad said, eat it and I will give you an apple to bring home. Oh so <laughs> every Christmas, it's something I do. Um, especially after my dad died, I'd make meals for... Oh my gosh, I just keep making you cry. <laughs> I make meals for street kids and we all, always include apples and give it away. So it's something also that, you know, I've taught my kids ever since they were, they were little that, you know, Christmas, you get a lot of gifts. So my kids, when they were little, your birthdays are always special. You get things you like. But Christmas is for other people who won't get as much as you do. Ah. So that's something we always do. So my... Uh I guess when I was asking that question, I was just going to ask, like, what could you do in terms of, like, um, with a healthcare worker? So I guess you could call, someone had mentioned, I think that was in one of the podcasts in the States, and they said that you can actually just call the hospital and say, can we 
send some food to the ER, like to the ER staff. And they actually welcome that. So that's something. But your story of the apple just actually like really hit me hard. And I guess this is like the perfect way to to wrap up this this interview with, I guess one thing you can, we can, personally, it hits me so hard. That it's making me ask, what is that one apple that you could do? What is that one who can you give that apple to this this Christmas? And it doesn't have to be a healthcare worker. It doesn't have to be, it could be anyone. And it's just that one act that you're actually, it's a tradition you're continuing on that your your father had passed on. Wow. I didn't, I'm so so I didn't expect this interview to be like a crying <laughs> session even before, even before Diana had joined us. Waya has already been crying because of my introduction of who she was and what she has done. Um, is there anything else you'd like to share? And if you'd like to to tell our, our listeners and readers like where they can connect with you, if they can connect with you on Instagram or on Facebook. Yeah. And if there's something like a project or something that you, you want people to, to be more, um, to participate with, the floor is yours. Yeah. Um, well, we do projects all year and, you know, we, I can't really announce just yet. So we don't know what's happening. <laughs> We don't know what calamity is going to hit next. <laughs> we don't know what's happening. We don't know where we are at the moment. Um, so, but you can find me on Facebook, Chef Y. Arauz Bianco, Gourmet Gypsy, uh, Chef Y on Instagram. And uh, we just keep rolling and we keep, you know, trying to find ways to be relevant, to be of service. And to be kind so if there's any uh if there's any message is that kindness matters that's yeah. that's what's painted on your school <laughs> on my school are there do you have any questions diana rose any questions or a feedback or i'll i'll, I'll unmute I'll feel free to um how do you unmute i have to ask you to unmute oh there you go there we go I, I don't have any questions. It's been very interesting. It's been fun to listen to and, and learn. Thanks for joining in. Um, yeah, so so I guess that's um, that's how we're <laughs> it. This is how we're going to to end today. Have a merry Christmas. <laughs> <laughs> I, I guess so uh, <laughs> ultimately, it's it's like having. Um, a good Christmas and 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 to count your blessings at this point the, um, as as much as you're blessed and so you you're you're it allows you to to give some more and and um, keep shining this bright light Waya because like as I said in the beginning which I didn't mean to make you cry the whole time but it's it's really in the Philippines are one of the, the most significant um, Christmas icons is the parole. And it shines so bright. It's it's the Christmas light. It's the Christmas lantern that you would see everywhere in the Philippines, probably as early as September, you would see people um, starting to sell this beautiful Christmas lanterns. And that's what, that's, and the, it's based on the, the star that, that brought, the wise men to Jesus. It's it's the it's the Christmas star, and basically that's what we need in this world. People like Waya who who shine bright, and we all have that capacity. We all have it within us. And I guess sometimes it's just a matter of asking yourself, like something as simple as what is that apple that I can give today, and then to flex that muscle again and to flex that muscle again. And maybe one day you'll be called to cook for 60 people. Maybe one day you'll be called to cook for 2,000 people and 1,000 more the next day and 1,000 more the next day and until it becomes a lifestyle. And as why has taught us today, kindness matters. And amidst 2020, that shines so bright. Thank you so much, Waya. And thank you so much for everyone who's joined. Um, it's been so beautiful sharing and it's just been so beautiful like 
hearing this story of hope, hearing this story of generosity and of kindness that still exists in this world. And um, thank you so much for sharing your story until the next episode, until we meet each other again and keep shining bright, everyone. Merry Christmas. Thanks very much. Bye. Thanks very much. Bye. Bye. Bye.